trust us to them before he can evaluate limits. The answer, my friend, will be found in this video. The answer will be found in this video. Alright, so what we're going to do in this video is study a whole bunch of rules, sometimes called limit laws, that are very useful for evaluating limits of functions. Okay, so let me start with perhaps the two simplest limits you could think of. First is the limit of a constant. So this is saying that the limit as x goes to a of a constant c is just equal to c itself. Now this is clear from the graph of the function, which in this case is just a horizontal line y equals to c. So for any a, it's clear the limit will just give you c again. The second one is just as straightforward. It's saying that the limit as x goes to a of the function x is equal to a. Again, that follows from the graph, which in this case is going to be a line with slope 1 going through the origin. All right, so these are very simple, but it turns out that with these two limits and a number of limit laws, we can actually calculate the limits of much more complicated functions. So let me now present these famous limit laws. So I'm going to talk about here two general functions, f of x and g of x. But I need to assume that the limit as x goes to a of both functions exists. So if one of them is infinite, for example, then these rules here may not hold. And I should say as well that I'm not going to prove any of these laws here. Uh, to prove them, I would need to use the rigorous definition of limits, which we will not see in this class. But they're pretty easy to, to understand, and it's very intuitive, so I don't really need to prove them for the moment being. All right, so the sum rule here is saying that the limit as x goes to a of the sum or difference of two functions is going to be equal to the sum or difference of the limits. Again, that's clear from the graph of the functions. The product rule is saying that the limit of the product of two functions is going to be the product of the limits. Same for the quotient rules. The limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits. But here, I have to be careful. I must require that the limit as x goes to a of g of x is non-zero. Otherwise, on the right-hand side here, I would be dividing by zero. And the last one is the root rule which is saying that the limit as x goes to a of the root of a function is going to be equal to the root of the limit. Now, there's a subtlety here as well. And if uh, well, n here is an arbitrary positive integer, integer, but if n is even, I need to require that the limit as x goes to a of f of x is greater than 0. Otherwise, uh, here the root would not be real, and the limit would not be well defined. Okay, so how can we apply these rules in practice? Well, here's the first example. Suppose that I know that the limit as x goes to 2 of a function f of x is equal to, say, 5, and that I also know that the limit as x goes to 2 of another function, g of x, is equal to 6, say. And then I want to calculate the limit as x goes to 2 of the quotient of the functions. Well, first you may be kind of a little puzzle, because I, I'm not actually telling you what f of x or g of x are. So we don't know what the functions are, but we can still evaluate this limit just by using the limit rules. right? So what you would do here is use the quotient rule. So this is the limit of a quotient. So this should be equal to the quotient of the limits, as long as the limit in the de denominator, so the limit as x goes to 2 of g of x, is non-zero. But in this case, indeed, it is non-zero. So now I can use the data given in the problem. I know that the limit of f of x in the numerator is 5, the one in the denominator is 6, and that gives me my answer. So I could calculate the limit even though I did not know what f of x and g of x are. Okay, so that was the first example. But in fact, we can also use the uh, limit rules or limit laws to calculate the limit of very explicit functions. So let me give you another example. Suppose I want to calculate the limit as x goes to 1 of some uh, let's say this function, 2x plus 1 over x squared plus 2. How can I evaluate that? Well, we're just going to use the limit laws repeatedly to be able to reduce that to the simplest case that we studied first. Okay, so first this is a quotient of two polynomial functions. So I can rewrite that as the limit as x goes to 1 of the function upstairs divided by the limit as x goes to one of the function downstairs. That's the quotient rule, oops, x squared plus 2. 
as long as the limit downstairs is non-zero. So we have to keep that in mind, but in fact it is non-zero here as we'll see, so that's, that's okay. Okay, so that was the first rule. Now we can use the sum rule, both for upstairs and downstairs, because we have a limit of a sum. So upstairs I'll get the limit as x goes to 1 of 2x, plus the limit as x goes to 1 of 1. And downstairs I'll get the limit as x goes to 1 of x squared, plus the limit as x goes to 1 of 2. And finally, I can use the product rule for the first limits here, uh, both upstairs and downstairs, because they're the limit of a product of functions. So I get the limit as x goes to 1 of 2 times the limit as x goes to 1 of x for the first term, plus the limit as x goes to 1 of 1. Whole thing divided by here, x squared is x times x. So really, I get the limit as x goes to 1 of x times the limit x goes, x goes to 1 of x, plus the limit as x goes to 1 of 2. And finally, I can evaluate everything, because now all I have is uh, either limits of constants or limits of x, which I know how to evaluate by the first two rules that we saw. So the limit of a constant is the constant, so I get 2. The limit of x as x goes to 1 is 1. Limit of 1 is 1. Limit of x as x goes to 1 is 1 times same, plus the limit of a constant, which is 2. So I end up with 2 plus 1, that gives me 3, over 1 plus 2, which gives me 3. So I end up with 1 as my final answer. So this is the limit of this rational function here. Okay, that worked, but that was very long and very pedestrian. Is there a way that we can evaluate limits faster than that? Fortunately, yes, there is, at least for continuous functions. So recall that a function f is continuous at a point x equals to a, precisely if its limit is equal to f of a. So in other words, you can turn things around, and if you know that the function is continuous at x equals to a, you can evaluate its limit just by substituting x equals to a in the function. But now you're probably wondering, this is nonsense. Because how do you know that the function is continuous? Well, you need to prove this property. So you first need to evaluate the limit. And then I'm telling you that you can actually evaluate the limit by using this property. So it's just going around, right? It doesn't make sense. But the key here is that we can actually prove in full generality, generality that there's a whole bunch of functions that are always continuous. For example, polynomial, rational, root, trig, exponential, and log functions are all continuous in their domain. So whenever you see one of these functions, uh, and that x equals to a is in the domain, then you can evaluate the limit just by using the substitution property. So let me give you an example, and we'll see that this is a lot faster than using limit laws like we did in the previous slide. Suppose that you want to, to evaluate the limit as x goes to minus 1 of a polynomial, say 4x squared plus x plus 2. Well, we could use the limit laws as we did before, or we can realize that this is a polynomial function, so it is continuous. The particular is continuous at x equals to minus 1. So I can evaluate the limit just by substituting x equals to minus 1 in my polynomial function. And I get 4 times minus 1 squared plus minus 1 plus 2, which is the same as 4 minus 1 plus 2, which gives me 5. And that is the final answer. So that was a lot faster than using the limit loss. All right, so the second example I want to give you is the following. Suppose I want to calculate the limit as x goes to 1 of the quotient, the rational function, x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. Now, this is a rational function, so it is continuous on its domain, but the problem here is that x equals to 1 is not in the domain of the rational function because it gets 0 over 0, All right, so it's not well defined. So how can I evaluate this uh, limit? So we've already seen a case like that in a previous video. What we did was the following. So first I realized that the numerator here is a difference of squares, so I can rewrite it as x minus 1 times x plus 1 divided by x minus 1. And then uh, the important thing is to realize that when you evaluate a limit, you're not really looking at the function precisely at x equals to 1, but you're looking at the behavior near x equals to 1. 
So you can assume in the, the thing inside the limit here that x is not equal to 1 because you're not evaluating at x, x equal to 1. So you can factor or simplify upstairs and downstairs by x minus 1 here, and you end up with the statement the, with the limit as x goes to 1 of the simpler function x plus 1, which is just a polynomial function. And this falls into the classes of function here. It is continuous at x equals to 1, so I can just substitute here. I get 1 plus 1, which is equal to 2. All right, but the, the key here was to be able to simplify here. So we can uh, try to make this more rigorous. So what? why was I allowed to do that? I mean, it makes sense intuitively. I could simplify here because x is not equal to 1. Can I formalize that a little bit more? So the formal statement is the following. If you have two functions, f of x and g of x, that are precisely equal except perhaps at the point x equals to a, then the statement is that the limit as x goes to a of both functions should be precisely equal as long as the limits exist. Okay, this is very formal, but what does it mean concretely? So if we go back to the previous examples, I had the limit as x goes to 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, and then I argued that by dividing upstairs and downstairs by x minus 1, I could rewrite that as the limit as x goes to 1 of the polynomial x plus 1. But what did I just do here a little more formally? So if I define a function f of x as being the original function x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, and g of x as being the polynomial x plus 1, well, first you realize that f of x can be rewritten by dividing upstairs and downstairs by x minus 1 as x plus 1 as long as x is not equal to 1 and it's actually undefined at x equals to 1 because it's not in the domain of the function. And now you see that f of x and g of x are in fact precisely the same function except at one point. Right, g of x is going to be a line with slope 1 going through the point 0, 1. And f of x will be the exact same line, but with a little hole here at x equals to 1. Right, so the two functions are exactly the same except that x equals to 1. So the statement of the theorem implies that the limit of both functions as x goes to 1 should be equal, which is exactly what we used in our previous calculation. Okay, this is very formal. What it means concretely is that when you evaluate the limit of a function as x goes to a, you can manipulate the function as much as you'd like. For example, you can simplify it by, I don't know, rationalizing, factoring, putting things on a common denominator, whatnot, assuming that x is not equal to a, and it will not change the limit. And the reason is that if you do all these manipulations, uh, it will not change the function away from x equals to a. Okay, so let me now present a very useful flowchart for evaluating the limit of a certain class of functions. So what I'll be interested in here is the limit as x goes to a of the quotient of two functions, f of x and g of x. And I need to assume that both f of a and g of a are finite. They could be zero. And also that f and g are simple enough functions, so I don't want to deal with piecewise defined functions or absolute values or things like that. Now that seems perhaps like a very restrictive class of functions, but for the time being it turns out that most functions that we'll be interested in fall into that class. Sometimes they may not fall directly into that class, but you can somehow manipulate them by putting things on a common denominator or things like that to rewrite uh, the functions into quotient functions satisfying these properties. Alright, so let's see how the flowchart goes. So the first step is to evaluate uh, both functions f and g at x equals to a. Now what could go wrong here? Well, the main thing is that the denominator could be equal to zero. So that's the first question, is g of a equals to 0? If it's not equal to 0, that means that f of a over g of a is a finite number. So in other words, the function here is continuous at x equals to a, so the limit is just given by evaluating at x equals to a. But if the denominator is 0, then there's two possibilities. The numerator could also be 0, in which case I would have a 0 over 0 case, or the numerator could be non-zero and finite, in which case I would, I would get a kind of non-zero finite number over 0 case. So let's look at the first one first. So if the numerator is 0, then I have 0 over 0. So I go here. Now what it says is that I should, I should use algebraic techniques to rewrite or simplify the quotient. So what that means is that I can use factorization, rationalization, common denominator, whatnot. But the idea is to simplify the quotient so that I kind of get rid of the 0 over 0. So you do these manipulations, and then you go back to the start. You have new functions, f and g, and you just follow the steps again. So that's the 0 over 0 case. If the numerator is non-zero, 
then you end up with the case where you have a non-finite, a non-zero finite number over zero. So that means the limit will be infinite. So in this case, you need to evaluate both one-sided limits separately. So you first evaluate the right-sided limit and then the left-sided limits. And then if the two are the same, you can conclude that the limit is either plus or minus infinity. Or if they are different, you conclude that the limit does not exist. Okay, so let me do one last example, this time slightly more complicated, where I'm going to use the flowchart explicitly. So suppose that I want to calculate the limit as x goes to 0 of the function square root of 2 plus x square minus square root of 2 minus x square, the whole thing divided by x square. First, I need to check whether this falls into the category of functions that I can uh, use the flowchart for. So I need to check whether the numerator and the denominator are both finite as x equals to 0. But as x equals to 0, the numerator goes to square root of 2 minus square root of 2, which is just 0. That's fine. And the denominator is also 0. So that's okay. All right, so if I follow the flow chart, then, well, we've just calculated that the denominator is 0. So then I follow the arrow. And then I need to calculate what the numerator is, but we've just said that this is 0 as well. So now I fall into the 0 over 0 category case. So what do I need to do? Well, the flowchart says that I should manipulate uh, the expression uh, by using factorization, rationalization, whatnot. Now, there's no magical recipe to tell you what you should do here. But the more limits you evaluate, the better you will be at figuring it out uh, quickly. But uh, how can I simplify this expression? Well, if I look at it, I see that there are some square roots in the numerator. So maybe what I could try to do is to rationalize the numerator. So let's try that. So what I'll do is multiply upstairs by square root of 2 plus x square plus square root of 2 minus x square, and then divide by the exact same thing. So what I'm doing here is really just multiplying by 1, so I'm certainly allowed to do that. But if I do that, then what do I get? Well, the numerator will become 2 plus x square minus 2 minus x square, and the denominator will be x squared times the whole thing, square root of 2 plus x squared plus square root of 2 minus x squared. And then I can simplify the numerator further. 2 minus 2 is 0, x squared minus minus x squared. That gives me 2 x squared divided by x squared times the square root of 2 plus x squared plus square root of 2 minus x squared. And then I can simplify, so I can divide both upstairs and downstairs by x squared. I'm allowed to do that because I'm evaluating the limit at x equals to 0, which means that I'm, uh, x is not actually equal to 0. So I can divide by x squared. And what do I get? Well, I get the limit as x goes to 0 of a new quotient of two functions, 2 over square root of 2 plus x squared plus square root of 2 minus x squared. Then I go back to the beginning of the flowchart. What happens when I evaluate at x equals to 0? Well, now it turns out that, well, the numerator is just 2, but the denominator becomes square root of 2 plus square root of 2. So it's not 0 anymore. That means this function is continuous at x equals to 0. So I can evaluate the limit just by substituting x equals to 0. I'll get 2 over square root of 2 plus square root of 2, which is the same as 2 over 2 square root of 2, which is just 1 over square root of 2. Okay, so as you can see, the flowchart can be very useful for evaluating the limit of functions. Now, the hard part here was the simplification part, but the more exercises you do, the better you will be at finding quickly what kind of manipulations you need to do here. Aside from that, just following the flowchart is very, very efficient.